Paper Mario is an RPG that would later serve as the inspiration for the Paper Mario series of puzzle games. Like most turn-based RPGs, you collect two things after almost every battle, experience points and money. These are both important parts of how you progress through the game, so what happens if we completely ignore one of them? In this video I'm going to find out and try beating Paper Mario without ever using money. If you've seen the video where I attempted this challenge for the Thousand Year Door then you'll know the rules already, but I'll run through them again for those who didn't. The goal is to complete the game without ever losing coins for any reason. The most obvious impact of this rule is that I can't buy things, but it also applies to situations that you might not think of right away. For example, if you flee a regular battle, Mario drops coins and that's not allowed. I can pick them back up, but the goal is to never lose the coins in the first place. If I ever lose coins, I have to restart and load my last save. The playthrough will be a success if I beat the game without losing coins. But that brings me to rule number two. In some games, there are points where you have to use money to proceed. In the Kanto Pokemon games, for example, you have no choice but to pay the entry fee to get into the Safari Zone, since you need the key items that are inside. Since moments like these are completely mandatory, they're allowed. The idea is to add a self-imposed challenge to the playthrough to make the gameplay more unique, so story moments are excluded. It'd be like ending a hoverless playthrough of Mario Sunshine, because Mario hovers in the cutscene you have to watch. If I manage to finish the game, at the end of the video I'll tell you how much money is absolutely required by the story. The third rule is that I can't use glitches to skip things. There's also one more rule for this game that didn't apply to the Thousand Year Door. In the Thousand Year Door, inns and recover blocks cost money to use, which meant I couldn't use them for this challenge. In the original Paper Mario, they're both completely free. This is actually why I ended up doing a video on the Thousand Year Door first. In this game, healing is free, so the whole survival element is gone since you can always just run back to an inn when you're in danger. So for this challenge, inns and heart blocks are also banned. This also includes other similar sources of healing like Mario's bed. With that out of the way, let's get started. The combat early on is very simple. Unlike the Thousand Year Door where you start the game with action commands, in the first Paper Mario there are a feature you unlock after making a bit of progress. What this meant is that until I unlocked them I could only do simple jump and hammer attacks, and I couldn't defend against attacks made against me. As a result, there isn't much to say about the early parts of the game. I basically just had to mash the A button through battles, and they weren't very difficult. After Goombario joined the party I made my way to Toad Town. There's a boss fight on the road there and several enemies that were somewhat tough to dodge. Since I couldn't block attacks yet, I took damage in every enemy encounter so my HP got knocked down pretty quickly. They expect you to heal up using the heart block, so this road is definitely a little more challenging than they probably ever expected. But there are plenty of items to pick up in the early areas of the game, so I was able to heal myself up when I had to. Also in the fight against the Goomba King I leveled up. Leveling up fully heals you just like in the Thousand Year Door. I raised HP so I'd have more to work with. After reaching Shooting Star Summit and seeing one of these, I unlocked Action Commands. Now that I could defend and do more damage to finish battles quicker, things became more manageable. However, unlike in the Thousand Year Door, in the first Paper Mario game you can only perform the regular guard. Super guards don't exist. So I was able to lower the damage I was taking, but I couldn't negate it completely. In a similar vein, partners also work differently in this game. They don't have their own HP, so unlike in the Thousand Year Door they can't tank hits for you when Mario's HP gets low. I figured I'd probably have to manage Mario's HP much more carefully in this game. After heading back to Toad Town and getting the Koopa Bros out of the way, I headed east to start chapter 1. There's not too much to say about the early section of chapter 1. Cooper joined the group, I saved Koopa Village from some fuzzies, and after some adventuring I reached the Koopa Bros Fortress. While in the fortress I picked up the Power Bounce Badge. If you saw my Thousand Year Door video then you know how powerful this is. Basically you can jump on an enemy an infinite amount of times until you mess up the timing. Against bosses there's actually a cap on how many times you can jump with a single Power Bounce, because otherwise you could just kill them in one go on turn 1. The enemies in the fortress were easy and I got to the boss pretty fast. The chapter 1 boss was also super easy and there's really not much to say about it. They were able to deal some good damage, but the fight never felt out of my control and I beat it without using any items. And with that, the first Star Spirit was saved. After one of these, the Star Spirit gave Mario the special ability Refresh, which restores 5 HP and 5 FP. This isn't as versatile as Sweet Treat from the Thousand Year Door, but it's still very helpful since it's a way to heal without wasting my limited items. On the way to the train that goes to chapter 2 I hopped down to the sewers where I fought a blooper mini boss for fun. This fight went very much like the Koopa Bros fight. The blooper was able to deal some good damage to me, but I won and never felt like I didn't have things under control. After that I headed to the train and started chapter 2. On that rugged I said hi to Waka. Just like the one at the thousand year door, hitting this guy gives you a really good healing item. But that is messed up, don't do that. I said a friendly hello and headed on my way. An enemy in this area worth pointing out are the clefts. If you watch my thousand year door video you might remember these guys. Their defense is higher than other enemies, so you can't damage them with your normal attacks at this point in the game. You have to use items or special moves to do it. In the Thousand Year Door I usually beat these guys with super guards, but that's not an option in this game so I tried my best to avoid them. If I ran out of FP and attack items, I would have no choice but to try recovering FP through star power, taking damage all the while, since I couldn't flee or I dropped coins. In this area, I also picked up the Damage Dodge Badge. This badge makes it so that when I successfully guard against an attack, the damage is lowered by 2 instead of just 1. Since I can't super guard in this game, this is very valuable. On the bridge leading from Mount Rugged to Dry Dry Desert, Buzzer appeared. 
He asks for your name. If you tell him it's Mario or Peach, he fights you, but if you say you're Luigi, you can skip the battle. I decided to fight him though, for the star points and for the challenge. The fight was a lot closer than I expected, but I did manage to win. His strongest attack did 4 damage when I couldn't get out, so I made sure to keep my HP at 5 or above at all times and got through it. But on top of using the refresh special ability, I also used up all of my healing items, which meant the desert ahead would be much harder. Maybe it wasn't such a good idea to fight him. And unfortunately, there was even more bad news. Once I got to Dry Dry Outpost at the east end of the desert, there was a point where I had no choice but to use money. To get to Mostafa here, I had to buy specific items from the shop in a specific order, much like how you get to Don Pianta in the Thousand Year Door. I had to buy a dried shroom and a dusty hammer in that order. These cost 2 coins each, for a total of 4 coins spent in the shop. And of course, I sold the items back to the shop after I got them. I was now able to head for the ruins where the chapter boss was, but the problem was that I only had 2 HP left. This wasn't a super easy situation to get out of. The pokies here deal 2 damage per attack, so even with damage dodge equipped, missing a guard even once meant an instant KO. My plan at first was to stall in a battle against some pokies while spamming refresh to raise my HP slowly, but it wasn't working out. So I was left with no choice but to... Say a friendly hello to Waka as I left the desert entirely and headed all the way back to Toad Town. Just outside of town I fought a Koopa Troopa. One jump knocks these guys over, and they don't take any damage from the jump that knocks them over. So as long as I don't do the action command, I can purposely avoid damaging him, and can make him unable to attack me. So I spent several turns knocking the Koopa Troopa over with Goombario, while Mario used Focus and Refresh. It's completely risk free, and it let me heal all the way back to full. After that, I headed back to the desert, and headed for the ruins. I avoided as many battles as I could, and whenever my HP got low, I was able to use a similar healing strategy using Refresh on the Buzzy Beetles, which work very similar to the Koopa Troopas. I also picked up the Super Hammer in the ruins, raising the power of my hammer attacks by 1. I also found a Super Block in the ruins. These blocks are what you use to upgrade your partners in this game. I upgraded Goombario, which gives him the Charge Command. If you watched my Thousand Year Door video, then you'll know how much I like that command. However, you might be surprised to learn that Goombario is actually not my partner of choice in this game. I'll explain why a bit later on, but I upgraded him here because my favorite partner was not in the group yet. At the end of the dungeon, I fought the chapter boss Tutan Koopa. This fight wasn't too difficult. He summons a chain chop that deals decent damage, but I just focused on Tutan Koopa since the fight ends when he's defeated. I had to use refresh once, but I made it through just fine. And with that, the second star spirit was saved. After one of these, I said hello to Waka again, and then went back to town and into the forest for chapter 3. The woods leading to Bo's Mansion are a lot like the Lost Woods from Ocarina of Time. You have to take specific exits to make progress or else you get sent back to the entrance. But it's not very difficult and I made it to the mansion. While in the mansion I grabbed the super boots, raising the power of my jump attacks by 1. More importantly though, Bo joined the group. Bo is the party member I used the most in the first game for a few reasons. First, Goombario gets multi bonk just like Goombella does in the Thousand Year Door, but the programming for Goombarios is bugged. I mentioned earlier that when you use Mario's power bounce against bosses, the game puts a cap on how many times you can jump with one use of the move. This cap applies to Goombario's multi bonk as well, except that they forgot to make the cap reset after each use. What this means is that you can basically only use multi bonk once in a boss fight before it becomes useless, since it'll now think you're at the cap as soon as you start jumping and you'll only get one or two jumps in before it forces you to stop. You can reset it by switching partners and then switching back to Goombario. Mario, but that wastes several turns and with that amount of wasted time, a different partner could probably do the same amount of damage he would have done. Now as for why I pick Bo specifically, I'm just a fan of her abilities. Her basic smack attack is super easy to charge and deal 6 damage when she's fully upgraded, which is more than many of the other partners. She can make Mario invincible for a turn without a sight, which is helpful for avoiding powerful attacks and especially so in a challenge like this where healing is limited. She can also scare enemies out of battle with spook, and can deal even bigger damage with fan smack. She's an easy partner to use with many helpful abilities. After that I went to Tubba Blubba's castle. It's a stealth dungeon. There are a bunch of enemies here, but if you walk instead of running you can avoid most of the fights. I only had to fight the enemies I chose to fight. I was able to avoid every single enemy I didn't want to fight. After getting what I came for and being chased out of the castle, I ran for the windmill where Tubba Bubba's heart was waiting. On my first attempt against it I was doing well, but then I made a mistake. Since Bo is the partner you get in this chapter, some of the mechanics including the stealth dungeon are designed to make use of her abilities. In this fight the heart can charge up a strong attack and you're supposed to use out of sight to protect yourself. But I accidentally used it on a turn when he wasn't charging, so I took 12 damage from the attack and died. On my second attempt against the heart, I didn't make a mistake and did perfectly fine. After you defeat the heart, it runs away and reunites with a body, but this is basically a joke fight. Although he can deal good damage, he only lasted until turn 2, and with that the third star spirit was saved. After one of these, I started heading back towards Toad Town. On the way back, there's another battle against Junior Troopa. Something I should point out is that Bo's basic smack attack is a bunch of consecutive hits for 1 damage each. I mentioned earlier that she deals 6 damage with her basic attack when fully upgraded, but that's because she does 6 attacks that do 1 damage each. While this normally doesn't mean anything, when an enemy has defense, her smack attack can't damage them. That was the case against Junior Troopa, but I still kept her in so I could use out of sight if I needed to avoid something powerful. My HP got low, but the fight was easy enough and I got through just fine. When I made it back to Toad Town, I found it overrun with Shy Guys causing mischief. Huh. 
Seems familiar. Before dealing with that though, I headed for Merlo's house. For 12 star pieces, I got the Heartfinder badge. If you watched my Thousand Year Door video, you'll know how useful this is. This badge makes enemies drop more hearts after battles than usual, and each heart heals 1 HP. This means that weak enemies who normally drop almost nothing now drop hearts after almost every battle, giving me another easy way to heal up when I need to, and also making it easier to stay healed up. I found out how useful this was in my Thousand Year Door playthrough, so I wanted to make sure to get it here. Although the challenge hadn't felt too difficult up to this point, healing items had been pretty scarce, my HP had been low for most of the game, so I wanted to grab this badge to make things safer going forward. After grabbing that, I hopped into the toy box and started Chapter 4. Inside the toy box, I took on all of the random enemies I came across. With Heartfinder equipped, every battle dropped several hearts for me to heal with. So now I didn't have to worry so much about taking damage, and could earn star points more easily as I traveled. This chapter isn't very hard overall. For the most part, it focuses on retrieving stolen items and bringing them back to their owners in Toad Town, who give you new items and clues that let you advance further in the toy box so you can get more. That's not to say it was completely easy though. Some enemy groups were difficult, and in one battle I actually fell to just 1 HP left on Mario and had to gamble on a dizzy dial stunning an enemy to give me time to heal. But those moments were few and far between, and most of the chapter went very smoothly. Later in the chapter, there's a mini boss fight against the big lantern ghost. This fight is also fairly easy. I smacked the lantern a few times with Bo to light the area, attacked the ghost with Mario, and repeated. Whenever Bo took damage and got knocked out, I stalled for one turn and then continued the process. It wasn't very difficult. Watt joined the group after the lantern ghost fight, and with her in the group I continued. The remainder of the chapter went easily enough, and pretty soon I made it to the chapter boss, a general guy. This fight is pretty unique in that general guy doesn't actually do any fighting himself at first, and you can't attack him either. He summons a few waves of enemies that you have to get through before he joins in. For the first part of the fight, I used bow like normal, and got through the three enemy waves easily enough. Once I got to general guy himself, I switched to Watt. General Guy is in a tank with high defense, but Watt's default attack ignores defense entirely, so she can damage him easily. I made Mario a pure healer through focus and refresh. There's a light bulb in the tank that can do a fairly powerful attack, so I took it out first, and then focused on General Guy himself. Although my HP got low, the fight never felt out of my control, and with that I saved the next star spirit. After one of these, I headed back to town and went for the docks. There's a club by the docks, and for some reason they decided to give it a really catchy theme, even though you never actually have to go inside. How about a cola? There's a whale by the docks with a fuzzipede in its stomach, so I beat it up. It's a very easy fight. You have to use Watt as your partner to light up the area so you can see it, but other than that, there's not much to this fight. This fight gave me enough star points for another level, and this level up is worth pointing out because I now had 6 unspent badge points. Now I could equip the Defend Plus badge I picked up in the toy box. This raises Mario's natural defense by 1, and since I still had damage dodge equipped, a successful guard would now block 3 damage, up from the original 1 damage. With the fuzzipede defeated, I hopped on the whale and headed for chapter 5. The first section of the island went just fine. The enemies by the shore aren't too hard and I got around just fine. After Sushi joined the party, I had to search the jungle for the Yoshi kids. There are five of them to find, and you have to fight enemies to make it to some of them. Thanks to Heartfinder and Defend Plus, it was a pretty easy journey. After that, I headed deeper into the jungle. Along the way, there was a mini boss fight against three piranha plants and a Magikoopa. I entered the battle with fairly low HP, but I knew it would give me enough star points to level up, so I fired off power bounces with Mario and it was a very easy fight. A little later on, I climbed the big tree to Raphael the Raven, and he got his little ravens to build something to let Mario get to the volcano, but he also gave me the Ultra Stone. That meant that from this point on, I could upgrade my partners an additional level at Super Blocks. You might expect me to Ultra Rank Bo first, but the boss in the volcano is made much easier if you Ultra Rank Sushi, and I'd upgraded her to Super Rank with a block earlier on in preparation for Ultra Ranking her here. Although there is actually more than one Super Block in the volcano, so I did Ultra Rank Bo as well along the way. The volcano wasn't too difficult for the most part. Some of the enemies were able to do good damage, but like with the jungle, Heartfinder, Defend Plus, and good timing on my guards kept me doing fine through most of the area. It's not that I wasn't taking any damage at all, but I had set Mario up to be durable so he could last for a long time. When my HP finally did start to get low, I used the refresh strategy to top myself back up, and that kept me in good condition all the way to the chapter boss. The chapter boss here is the Fire Piranha. The first phase of the fight is a decent challenge. The Piranha itself attacks for some good damage, and the two smaller Lava Buds also do attacks of their own for a total of three attacks every turn. I had enough HP to survive several turns of that, but I still wanted to try finishing the phase as fast as possible before my HP got dangerously low. For the first phase, I used Bow like normal and smacked the main body until it died. Once you defeat it, it comes back for phase 2. This time, they're on fire, so many moves can't hit them. This is why I upgraded Sushi earlier. With her ultra rank move Tidal Wave, she attacks all of them, and since it's a water attack, it does massive damage and stuns them all for a turn. Since I only had 10 FP and Tidal Wave cost 6, I used Mario to heal FP using the FP items I picked up, and Sushi used Tidal Wave on the turns where they lit back on fire. Since 
since this strategy stuns them over and over, they can't move at all and this phase of the fight is completely effortless. I leveled up from the boss fight, and since it was so close to its cap, I decided to upgrade HP one final time. Yes, that's right, the final time. In the first Paper Mario game, unlike the Thousand Year Door, your level caps at 27 and each stack can only be upgraded so far. You can only upgrade HP and FP to 50, and you can only upgrade BP to 30. Using badges, you can raise HP and FP past those limits a bit, but I knew that there would come a point where I couldn't get any stronger for what was coming up. In a normal playthrough, I wouldn't prioritize HP over FP and BP, but since I couldn't easily restore HP without the refresh strategy and I couldn't prepare good inventories for boss fights, I wanted to have as much HP as I could. And on the topic of HP, I got something helpful at this point. For saving the next Star Spirit, I got the special ability Smooch. This costs 3 star power instead of refresh's cost of just 1, but it restores 20 HP instead of just 5 HP, which is really good. From this point on, Smooch became my HP healing option of choice, but I still made use of refresh when I wanted to recover FP. During one of these, I got a last stand badge of Peach and put it in the magical chest. This chest is linked to the one at Shooting Star Summit, so I can put items I get as Peach inside this chest and get them as Mario. Why she doesn't get in there herself, I don't know. This badge makes it so that when Mario is under 5 HP, he takes half damage. So if I ever got into danger, I'd have even better defense to hopefully make it easier to get out of the situation. I headed for the chest and collected it, along with the other items I put in there as Peach and forgot to collect. Then I headed over to the Toad Town Gardens and started Chapter 6. The flower fields weren't too difficult to start. Some of the enemies were annoying when they'd put Mario to sleep, but it wasn't anything crazy. After making progress for a while, I reached the first mini boss fight, which is a fight against some Lakitus and Spinies. But this is one of those cases where I only call it a mini boss fight because it has the mini boss music. It wasn't hard at all. I took out the Lakitus, then took out the Spinies, and that was it. There really isn't much to say, it was a very easy fight. A little later on, I encountered the next mini boss, Michael. Just like the previous mini boss, Michael isn't too tough. He was able to do some damage, but it only took a few turns to take him out. After defeating him, he joined the group as the final party member. After a bit more running around, I faced the third mini-boss fight of the chapter, another group of Lakitus. After defeating them, I broke the machine covering the area in clouds, which opened the way to the chapter boss. While in the area leading to the boss, I picked up the Super Jump Charge badge. This is a lot like Charge from the Thousand Year Door, but it only affects jump attacks. Using it, I can charge up as many times in a row as I want, and the power of my next jump attack will increase by 3 each time I do. However, it costs 4 FP per use, which meant it wasn't very useful with the limited FP I had at this point. The chapter boss is Huff and Puff. This fight is kind of annoying. With every point of damage he takes, a smaller enemy will pop off of him. These smaller enemies attack as a group, and you tap A to get out, so they only do 2 damage per go, which is totally fine. Huff and Puff also has an attack where he blows smog at you, and you tap A for that one too, so it only deals 2 or 3 damage. The part that's annoying is that Huff and Puff can absorb the smaller enemies, healing 1 HP for each. He can also charge up and do a stronger lightning attack the following turn. The approach I ended up using was to smack with a bow, and then use the Star Storm special ability or an attack item with Mario to defeat all the smaller enemies at once while also dealing damage to Huff and Puff. The additional damage Huff and Puff took from Star Storm made a few new small enemies appear, but it meant he'd be healing for less HP than the damage I'd done. Whenever he charged the lightning attack, I used Out of Sight with Bow to avoid it. Sometimes if I didn't have enough star power to use Star Storm, I'd just attack with Bow and focus with Mario, and hope that Huff and Puff wouldn't heal that turn. This strategy worked, and I took down his HP, slowly but surely, right up until the final phase. Now I could have tried the fight again, maybe with Michael as my partner, or maybe after healing up a bit more, or maybe using a different approach. I could have done that. But there's something I haven't mentioned yet. In this area of flower fields, amazing daisies appear. These give out a massive amount of star points if you defeat them. And unlike in the Thousand Year Door, in this game they're extremely easy to find. All you have to do is come in and out of this area to see if one appears. These things have a lot of HP and they usually run away very quickly, so you have to act fast. To defeat them, I equipped the Power Rush and Mega Rush badges, and then ran into the thorns over and over until my HP dropped to 1. Power Rush increases Mario's attack by 2 when his HP is 5 or below, and Mega Rush increases it by 4 when he's at 1 HP. So at 1 HP, his attack power gets boosted by 6. This made defeating them with Power Bounce much, much easier. Whenever I leveled up, I dropped my HP to 1 again and continued the process. Since there's a level cap in this game, you can't get insanely overpowered like you can in the Thousand Year Door, so I decided I might as well go for the level cap right then, since it wasn't like I was going to have a better way of leveling later on. So I did just that, and trained my way up to level 27. After I finished leveling up, I headed back to Toad Town. I was planning to fight a weak enemy and use star power to heal up, but then I noticed Kent C. Koopa was blocking the way to Koopa Village. This guy is very much like Gus from the Thousand Year Door. He blocks the path and only lets you pass if you pay him or defeat him. Unlike Gus though, this guy is actually a powerful boss. I gave it a try for fun and lost, and I decided it wasn't worth the effort. So I did my healing using an enemy on the path to Goomba Village instead. The fact that I didn't completely destroy Kent C. Koopa probably shows how getting to max level in this game doesn't really mean you're overpowered. After healing up, I returned to the flower fields and challenged Huff and Puff again. Now that I had so much more FP, I was able to take advantage of the Super Jump Charge badge, and so I approached the fight in a similar way to how I approach many of the Thousand Year Doors bosses. 
I spent every turn charging with Mario while Bo did nothing. I intentionally avoided attacking with Bo so that Huff and Puff's smaller clouds wouldn't appear, eliminating his healing and the swarm attack. Whenever Huff and Puff charged his lightning attack, I used out of sight with Bo to avoid it. As I mentioned in my first attempt, most of Huff and Puff's moves don't really do much damage, so I didn't have to worry about healing. I charged until I was almost out of FP, and then went in with a power bounce. Destroying him in one go like that also let me avoid the final phase attack that killed me the first time around. By defeating him, I saved the next star spirit. After one of these, I headed for the Toad Town sewers to reach the next chapter. I also got the Ultra Boots while down there, raising the power of Mario's jump attacks by one. After that, I headed off to Shiver City for chapter 7. This chapter starts off with a murder. After Mario killed the person who falsely accused him of killing, I made my way east out of town where I fought Junior Troopa again. I hadn't healed up before heading out there, so I started the fight pretty drained. I used a jam and jelly to restore 50 FP, and then charged until I was down to just 2 HP. Then I used out of sight with Bo to give myself one more turn to charge, and followed up with a power bounce that took him out. After that I returned to the Toad Town sewers and used the closest shortcut pipe. I fought an enemy to heal using star power, and then headed back to Shiver City. Further outside of town I fought Monstar. This is basically a free fight though, and I took no damage at all. As I made my way up the mountain and through the Crystal Palace, I had to deal with a bunch of Dupla Ghosts. They transform into your partners, and you have to figure out who the real one is. Once you get it right, the fake ones fight you, and during the battle they morph into your active partner. At the start of each fight, I swapped to Bo. She was my usual partner, of course, but there's actually another big reason to pick her here. Because the Dupla Ghosts morph into your partner, they also attack like your partner does. I mentioned earlier in the game that Bo's smack attack does several hits for one damage each, which means she can't damage enemies with defense. Because Mario had one extra point of natural defense thanks to the Defend Plus badge, the Bo Dupla Ghost can't damage him at all. None of the fights in the palace were very challenging, and pretty soon I made it to the Crystal King. My HP, FP, and star power were drained, but I decided to give the fight a try anyway to see how I'd do. Fortunately, it was a very easy fight. The Crystal King starts the battle with three crystal bits around him. On his first turn he shoots them at Mario, and on his second turn he summons three new ones. Then on his next turn he shoots them again. This repeats infinitely until he starts taking some damage, so after using a jam and jelly to restore 50 FP, I could charge with Mario as much as I wanted, and completely avoid the damage by using out of sight with Bo every second turn. After repeating that for a few turns he went down very easily, and with that the final star spirit was saved. After one of these it was finally time to head for Bowser, but before I did that I had some other things I wanted to take care of. This game doesn't have anything as challenging as the Pit of 100 Trials, but it does still have some optional battle challenges to take on. First, I headed back to Kent C. Koopa. He disrespected Mario earlier, and now he was going to pay the price. Earlier I said I didn't try this fight again because it wasn't worth the effort. That's because this fight is actually incredibly easy if you know what you're doing, and I just didn't feel like going through the process before this point. I entered the battle with Gumbario as my partner. Kent C. Koopa works like the Koopa Troopas, so I used Gumbario to knock him onto his back. Mario followed up with the Lullaby Special ability. This guy is vulnerable to sleep, so once you do this you've basically already won. He goes to sleep for 4 turns, so I charged with Mario for 3 turns, and then did a power bounce on the 4th. Once he wakes up, he's stuck on his back for a turn since he's still knocked over, so I used Lullaby again and put him out for another 4 turns. Rinse and repeat, and he never gets back up after he first goes down and the fight is effortless. After healing up off a weak enemy outside of town, I headed for the dojo. The dojo is this game's closest equivalent to the Pit of 100 Trials, in the sense that it's this game's big optional test of strength. This place has a few fights you can do, and each one you win raises your rank and earns you a certificate proving you won. There's no reward for doing this besides being able to show off to a few NPCs, but it's a fun challenge so I thought I should attempt it. The dojo had been available for a long time at this point, so the first few battles were super easy. The first fight was against Chan, who flips over when jumped on making him an easy win. The second fight was against Lee. He's a dupla ghost, so he copies Bo, and you know what happens there. The third fight is against the Dojo Master. He was the first one who actually managed to damage me, but he still went down very easily. For the fourth fight, the Dojo Master gets good and powers up. This was another simple fight. He dealt a lot of damage, but it wasn't enough to take me down before I'd charged enough to take him down to the power bounce. After healing up off an enemy outside of town, I came back for the fifth and final fight. This is another fight against the Master's stronger form, except he's even better now for some reason. This is one of the game's hardest fights. In this fight, he has 99 HP and 10 attack, and he also has defense, meaning Bo's normal smack attack doesn't hit. I kept her in for out of sight though. My strategy for the fight was fairly simple. I charged with Mario every turn, and Bo used out of sight every turn she could. When she uses out of sight, she's unable to act on the next turn, so basically I was invincible every second turn. The master does ridiculous damage, but thanks to out of sight I was able to survive long enough to use up most of my FP, and the power bounce was able to defeat him. And with that, the game's optional battle challenge was complete. Bowser is toast. <laughs> After healing up off a weak enemy outside of town again, I headed for Shooting Star Summit. On the way there, I swung by Merlo's house and grabbed the Peekaboo badge by trading him some star pieces. This lets me see enemy HP without using Tattle. I like this because it gives me a little bit of extra information to strategize around. If my HP is low in a boss fight, I'll usually try to heal up, but if I can see the boss's HP is almost gone, it might be better to just finish them off quickly. After making my way to Star Haven, the Star Spirits gave me the power to counteract Bowser's Star Rod, so I made my way to the castle for the final chapter. 
The castle is full of obstacles and traps, so you have to do a lot of puzzle solving to make your way through. The first mini boss fight is against three Koopa Trolls and a Magic Koopa, but I use the up and away special ability to win the battle instantly. I approached most of the battles in the castle this way. A little later on, I reached some Bullet Bill Blasters. These shoot out Bullet Bills, and then the Bullet Bills attack and destroy themselves every second turn. So these battles gave me a chance to completely heal and recover star power for up and away, while using out of sight with bow every second turn to completely avoid taking damage. Using up and away and avoiding enemies where I could, I made it through most of Bowser's castle very easily. Towards the end of the castle, there's a fight against some dupla ghosts. As usual, they were completely useless against me once they morphed into bow, so it gave me plenty of time to heal up again using star power. In the very next room, I had to do the final fight against Junior Troopa. Throughout the game, he used many different forms across the different battles, and in this battle he changes between those forms as he takes damage. So of course, all I had to do was charge until my FP was almost gone, and then destroy him with a power bounce in one go, completely skipping the more difficult stages of the fight. After that, the way to Peach's castle was open. Peach's castle is where the final boss fights happen, and my HP and FP were drained, so I used the items I picked up to heal. There were only two more boss fights left, and you get fully healed for the second one, so I wasn't too worried. Even using these items, I still had plenty I could use during the final battle if I needed to. The first Bowser fight in the castle was pretty easy. He was able to deal good damage though, and sometimes he would use the Star Rod to power himself up. Whenever he did, I used the new Star Beam special ability to remove the buff. He did good damage even without the buff, but as usual, Charge and Power Bounce got me the win after a few turns. After beating him here, he moves a few rooms ahead, where the real final battle takes place. I didn't bother healing up for the first phase of this fight, because it's a scripted battle that only lasts for a few turns before I get healed and phase 2 begins. I used Out of Sight with Bow over and over to make sure I wouldn't get defeated and waste a life room before the final phase. After a few turns, it switches over to Peach and Twink, who fight Kami Koopa. After they won, Mario got healed and the real final battle began. The final battle was pretty difficult. I started the fight like normal. I charged until I was almost out of FP and then used Power Bounds. But for some reason, even though the Star Rod's buff wasn't active, it still hardly did any damage. So from that point on, I stopped charging and just used Power Bounds every turn with Mario. I had two life shrooms on me, so I decided to let my HP drop to zero twice so I could start the battle focused on offense. Once the life shrooms were used up, I used the ultra shroom I picked up in the castle to fill my HP back to full. I had Bow out for a while at first, but ultimately decided to switch to Bombette. Bowser has defense, so Bow couldn't do damage. Out of Sight had been helpful many times throughout the game, but since Bowser had so much HP and my normal Mario strategy wasn't very effective in this fight, I wanted help to get through his HP. Bombette's bomb attack can deal up to 5 damage per go, depending on how much I tap the A button. So now I was dealing a total of about 10 damage per turn. Eventually my HP was starting to get low again, but I was out of HP healing items. I still had two jam and jellies I'd picked up throughout the game, so I could still recover 100 FP, but my only option for healing HP at this point were special abilities. Eventually I decided to just use Focus and Smooch with Mario while Bombette did the damage. Bowser's attacks were strong, and he can heal for 30 HP several times. There were points where I only survived because he decided to use a weaker attack than he could've, giving me just enough time to sneak in another heal. Because it was so tight, it made sense to be working towards another heal at all times. And you know what? None of that mattered at all, because with 10 HP left on Bowser, he got me. On my next attempt, I unequipped the Super Jump Charge badge since it didn't seem very useful in that fight. In its place, I equipped another Deep Focus badge and a Close Call badge. Close Call makes it possible for enemy attacks to completely miss when Mario's HP is 5 or lower, which could save me in a tight spot. Deep Focus makes me gain more star power when I use Focus. I had 3 Deep Focus badges equipped at this point, so each use of Focus would give me a lot of star power which I hope would let me heal more easily. I stuck with Bow for the first part of the fight so I could use Out of Sight to avoid wasting life rooms like the first time. Once I made it to the second phase, I immediately swapped to Bonnet. My approach for the fight was pretty similar to the first time. I let Mario get defeated twice to use up my life shrooms before I started healing so I could focus on offense. With Mario and Bombette both attacking, Bowser took a good 8 to 10 damage each turn. The biggest difference was that in my first attempt, I kept Bowen for quite a while before I switched, so by the time I started using Bombette, my HP and healing options were already limited. This time I brought Bombette out from the start, so I was able to start dealing good damage right from the get-go. That was actually all I needed to make a difference this time. Using basically the same approach as the first time, the extra damage from Bombette helped me win before Bowser could take me out. The fight still took a while because of Bowser's high HP and healing, but I did manage to win this time. And with that, the adventure is over. You can indeed beat Paper Mario without spending money. Besides when you absolutely have to at least. Mario can enjoy the party at the end of the game with his head held high, knowing he did absolutely nothing for the kingdom's economy. Unlike the Thousand Year Door, where there were several points where you had to use money for the story, in this game the only moment like that is at the shop in Chapter 2, where you have to use 4 coins to get to Mostafa. Besides that one instance, you never have to use money at all. So there we go! I found that the challenge was easier in this game than it was in the Thousand Year Door for the most part, even with Beds banned, but part of that might be because I already had experience with this rule set from the Thousand Year Door video, and knew to get Heart Finder and use Star Power to heal. It's still a fun challenge, and coming up with ways to heal on the fly makes the playthrough feel very unique compared to a normal one. I hope you enjoyed, and thank you for watching.